Hi, I'm Jim with UltrasoundBorderVid.com. Today I'm going to teach you all about ultrasound artifacts. Artifacts can very simply be described as anything that is displayed on the ultrasound screen that doesn't represent the actual image. Unfortunately, every sonographer will encounter an artifact on a daily basis. These illusions are not only seen in B-mode imaging, but also in spectral Doppler, color Doppler, and 3D imaging. Artifacts can be a huge problem not only because it can degrade imaging quality, but also it can create disease that's not there. The first artifact we're going to cover is called the lateral resolution artifact. Lateral resolution is the ability of the ultrasound machine to see two structures lying side by side perpendicular to the beam. This artifact will make two structures appear as one structure or it'll make one structure look like one long horizontal structure. This will occur when the beam width is actually wider than the distance between the two structures lying side by side. You're more likely to see these artifacts in the near field and the far field. There are a few different ways you can minimize lateral resolution artifacts. The first is use a high frequency transducer. Frequency and lateral resolution are directly related. When frequency increases, lateral resolution increases. This in turn will narrow the beam and decrease the depth. Using a narrower beam width will reduce the chances of two adjacent structures overlapping each other and appearing as one. Also, try to keep your region of interest or your ROI at the focal area. Since lateral resolution is best at the focal point, less artifacts will be seen in this area. Axial resolution is the ultrasound machine's capability of identifying two structures back to back or parallel along the ultrasound beam. When the spatial pulse length is wider than the distance between two structures, that's when artifacts start to occur. Increasing the frequency will decrease the spatial pulse length, thus increasing axial resolution. This means that axial resolution and frequency are directly related. So when frequency increases, axial resolution increases. And remember that frequency is inversely related to spatial pulse length. So when frequency increases, spatial pulse length decreases, thus improving axial resolution and minimizing axial resolution artifacts. Essentially, the spatial pulse length will determine the axial resolution image quality. As you can see in this diagram, the top animation represents a lower frequency and a longer spatial pulse length, thus tricking the machine into thinking that the two structures are appearing as one. As opposed to the bottom animation, this is a higher frequency with a shorter spatial pulse length, thus allowing the ultrasound machine to correctly identify the two structures. When ultrasound is emitted into the body, the stronger and more intense portion of the beam is concentrated in the middle, while the weaker and less intense portion of the beam will be displaced on each side. These are called side lobes. A side lobe is created when a less intense portion of the beam reflects off a strong reflector and is assumed by the ultrasound machine as coming from the central beam. This will cause the artifact to be displaced laterally or side by side next to the true reflector. Moving your transducer to a different area may minimize this artifact. As mentioned before, when ultrasound is emitted from a transducer, most of its energy is concentrated in the middle. This is called the main beam. However, there are weaker signals that are kind of displaced on each side. These are called side lobes and grating lobes. Grating lobes have a low intensity just like side lobes. And ideally, these weaker signals are supposed to dissipate and be lost forever. However, just like side lobes, if a grating lobe strikes an oblique strong reflector, the reflector will be counted as the main beam and displayed on your image. So just like a side lobe artifact, a grating lobe artifact is created when a grating lobe beam strikes a strong oblique surface and is reflected back to the transducer and is counted as part of your image. This will cause a lateral displacement of your anatomy. So in this image here, it looks like this patient has two aortic valves. Some of the ways of eliminating grating lobe artifacts include changing your patient position or changing your transducer angle and using harmonics imaging. The next two ways are terms that you'll have to know for your SPI boards. The first is called subdicing. This is simply taking a crystal and dividing it, making it smaller. The second is called apodization. This process involves using a lower voltage for the outer elements while using a higher voltage for the elements closer to the middle. Just how side lobes and grating lobes are very similar, well, grating lobe and refraction artifacts are even more similar. The sole indicator that differentiates refraction from grating lobe artifacts is edge shadowing. During refraction, the pulse will come down and strike an oblique surface and will change speed. This will cause the transmission pulse to either increase or decrease. As a result, this will cast an edge shadowing just below that transmission angle. But with grating lobe artifacts, you won't see edge shadowing. 
If ultrasound strikes a structure at an oblique angle that has two different propagation speeds on both sides, the ultrasound will change direction. This bending of the ultrasound will produce a copy of that original structure. In this image here, you can see that there are two complete copies of the abdominal aorta in the transverse view. Remember for your boards that refraction is governed by Snell's law and has nothing to do with reflection. As a beam exits the transducer, the size of the beam will match the size of the aperture. The beam will then propagate and converge to its narrowest point called the focal point, in which then it will start to diverge, wider than the size of the aperture. Beam width artifacts are created when the size of the beam is bigger than the actual structure you're looking at. For example, in this video here, you can see that inside the left atrium, it looks like there's sludge kind of building up down at the posterior part of the left atrium. But what's happening, since the beam is wider than the left atrium, the machine is taking echoes from both sides of the left atrium and averaging them in into the posterior part of the left atrium. This will create clutter inside of a chamber that will have sludge-like appearances, making a thrombus inside of a chamber. Some of the ways of reducing this artifact include reducing your scanning planes with a 1.5 dimensional ray transducer, moving your focus down to the region of interest, reducing your gains, and changing your scanning angle. A mirror imaging artifact occurs when a sound wave bounces off an oblique angle like the diaphragm and strikes a highly reflective structure before returning back to the transducer. What's happening is a pulse is reflecting off the diaphragm and striking another highly reflective structure. This will cause a portion of that beam to be reflected back to the transducer and a portion of that beam to be transmitted. Well, the portion that's transmitted will go back to the diaphragm and then back to the transducer. The machine assumes a one travel time for every pulse sent out into the body. However, in this instance, the pulse had to travel longer than usual, so the artifact will be displaced deeper into the tissue below the diaphragm. And sometimes there's no way to avoid that other than changing your transducer angle. The problem is that an inexperienced sonographer could think that this is a pleural effusion. I'm Jim with UltrasoundBoardReview.com. Stay tuned for part two of our three-part series on ultrasound artifacts. If any of you have any questions about anything regarding SPI, please don't hesitate to email me at ultrasoundboardreview at gmail.com or call or text at 435-922-1635. Thanks for watching.